All right, good morning, everybody. Um, we are about to get started. So uh, if you could um, please take your seats as soon as convenient. All right. Cool. Uh, well, thank you, everyone, so much for coming, um, both in person and virtually. This is a fantastic turnout, I'm told, especially for uh, an event that starts before noon here. So, um, yeah, my name is Charles Xu. I'm a member of uh, Chow Collective, uh, which is a diaspora Chinese media collective dedicated to challenging uh, U.S. and Western imperialism against China, um, both uh, militarily and uh, rhetorically. And we're absolutely thrilled to host this conference on China and the Left in partnership with our generous co-sponsors, the People's Forum, Monthly Review, and Code Pink. Um, yeah, uh, I guess without further ado, uh, let's get started on our first panel, which concerns Chinese development in global perspective. Um, we have a fantastic lineup of speakers. Um, uh, we have First up, Yen Hairong and Barry Saltman, uh, followed by Ting Chak, Max Isle, and Sit Sui. Um, so yeah, first up, uh, we have Yen Hairong and Barry Saltman. Um, Yen Hairong teaches at Hong Kong Polytechnic University. Her research interests include China-Africa links, racialization of labor, China's agrarian change, and collective and cooperative rural economy. She's the author of New Masters, New Servants, Migration, Development, and Women Workers in China, and has co-authored East Mountain Tiger, West Mountain Tiger, China, Africa, the West, and, quote, colonialism, and has also contributed to IPES Food and the Food Sovereignty Network in China. Barry Soutman, uh, a political scientist and lawyer at the Hong Kong University of Science and Technology, has worked on ethnic politics in China, including ethnic policies, the Tibet and Xinjiang issues, and relations between Hong Kong people and mainland Chinese. He co-authored with Yen Hairong, Localists and Locusts in Hong Kong, Creating a Yellow-Red Peril Discourse. And they, al they also researched China-Africa political economy and interactions between Chinese and Africans, most recently publishing China and Africa Discourses and Reality. So uh, to that end, uh, they will be speaking today on China, colonialism, neocolonialism, and globalized modes of accumulation. Um, please take it away. Thanks very much. Well, China, as a super accumulator of capital overseas, is part of a discourse of Chinese colonialism or Chinese neocolonialism. The discourse is uh, part of U.S. politicians and media's campaign to discredit China as a strategic rival or even as an enemy. China has accumulated a lot of capital for sure. Uh, the, it's the world's largest banking system. It has the world's largest foreign reserves. It has the second largest stock market, but a stock market that's only one-fifth the size of the U.S. stock market. But China is still very much a semi-peripheral state in a world system that's dominated by core countries. Claims of China as colonialist or neocolonialist are based mainly on its trade pattern that is buying primary products and selling manufacturers. But China, in fact, produces about 35% of the world's manufacturers. And of course, it sells these manufacturers everywhere, including to countries like Australia, Canada, and the United States, from which it buys mainly primary products. US and Canadian politicians may assert that their countries are Chinese colonies, based on trade, but China has no dominion over either one of these countries. China's main imports are manufacturers and not primary products. Colonialism is not merely a trade pattern either. It's a whole set of characteristics, including the occupation of territory, forcible domination and subordination of peoples, and often the de-development and of countries and imposed unequal trade. There's a second basis for asserting uh, the idea of colonialism and neo-colonialism for China, and that is the so-called Chinese debt trap. 
The claim is intended, of course, to discredit China's Belt and Road Initiative. And the Chinese debt trap is a kind of yellow peril conspiracy theory that Chinese seek to uh, addict others to debt and then seize the principal assets of the countries that are indebted. But we've shown in our own study of Chinese loans to Sri Lanka based on our field work in that country that the so-called Chinese debt trap is actually fictitious. This is just a map, of course, of the Belt and Road. And here's an illustration from the New York Times of the claim of the Chinese debt trap. And other illustrations from US media about the so-called Chinese debt trap. Well, if China is not colonial or neo-colonial, that only tells us, tells us what China's not. It doesn't tell us what China is. China's mode of accumulation of capital abroad, we would argue, reflects its semi-peripheral status within the world system. The mode of accumulation is also a function of China's semi-neoliberalism. Its firms mostly act like other foreign companies abroad, uh, but there are some distinctions. Many of them, of course, are state-owned enterprises. Almost all larger firms have the presence of the Chinese Communist Party, and they pay particular attention to the policies of both the home government, that is the Chinese government, and the host governments in the developing countries. So how is semi-peripheral, semi-neoliberal China not colonialist or neo-colonialist? Well, colonialism was a total loss of sovereignty and an exclusion from power for local elites. It was pervasively racist with laws that inferiorized colonized people and their cultures. Economic opportunities were of course reserved for the colonizers while the colonized had to pay the costs of their own colonial occupation. And colonialism, colonialism was of course very profitable for the colonizers. Here's an example from Dutch colonialism. And of course, the Netherlands was by no means the biggest colonial power in the world. The Dutch East Indies Company had profits that supplied 17% of Dutch national income in the period from 1921 to 1938. The profits from forced cropping in the Dutch East Indies, which is of course now Indonesia, brought in about one third of Dutch state income. And the profits allowed for high payments to slave owners uh, when the Dutch West Indies slaves were freed. Also, it allowed for rapid expansion of the Dutch railway system and postponement of Dutch income tax. There's no comparable racial dominion by China over developing states or enrichment of China by them. Chinese firms made about $137 billion in overseas profits in 2017, which is the last year for which we have uh, a figure for profits made by Chinese firms overseas. But this amounted to less than 1% of China's GDP. Meanwhile, U.S. firms made more than 4% of a significantly higher GDP in terms of profits made from overseas. And most Chinese profits overseas were likely from developed states rather than developing countries, because about two thirds of Chinese OFDI was flowing to the developed states then. And it's unclear whether overall Chinese firms profit in the developing countries. In fact, uh, it could be argued that overall they actually lose money in developing countries. Well, colonies uh, generally could only trade with their metropolitan countries. The metropoles banned producing in colonies those manufactured goods that might compete with their products. Colonialism de-developed and depopulated wide swaths of the planet. For example, Utsa Patniak uh, from uh, Nehru University in India has calculated that Britain drained the equivalent of 45 trillion US dollars of wealth from India from 1765 to 1938. China, however, fosters industrialization by exporting machinery and equipment and manufacturing capacity to developing countries. 
China builds the infrastructural predicates of industrialization. It does 40% of Africa's projects, for example, about the same as the entire West combined. Chinese products are cheaper and faster than the Western ones, and most projects are not tied to extractive industry. At the end of the colonial rule in, in the 1960s, 80% of Africans were illiterate. Congo, which then had about 60 million people, had only 16 university graduates at the time of independence. Meanwhile, in 2018, 82,000 Africans were studying in China, and there's almost no African brain drain to China, in contrast, of course, to the significant African brain drain to the West. Colonial repression also killed millions of people right up to the 1960s, but China, of course, has carried out no repression in developing countries. Well, 21st century politicians in the US, in Britain and France continue to praise colonialism. China experienced a kind of semi-colonialism and supported the struggles of colonized people. Meanwhile, the US supported European resistance to decolonization in the 20th century. The United States, Britain, and France have almost all the world's remaining colonies. Of course, these are generally small island uh, territories. China, of course, has no colonies at all. And the so-called Chinese colonies that the Western media often likes to talk about, for example, Zimbabwe, China has no determinative political influence. It is not even the most important foreign economic presence in most developing countries. And those countries have a lot of agency vis-a-vis -vis China. The field in which we work, China-Africa studies, there have been many, many studies by scholars illustrating this high degree of agency on the part of African countries with regard to China. Well, through neo-colonialism, uh, former colonizers use indirect rules to economically exploit the ones who colonized developing countries. The classic example is France Africa, that is France in Africa, a neo-colonialism that centered on French control of the CFA currency in 15 African states and also on French military interventions. CFA countries with no control over their own currency have lower rates of growth, but France profits nevertheless. These are the CFA uh, countries all former French colonies, of course, and now, to some extent, French neo-colonies. Well, the U.S. controls several ostensibly independent Pacific Island states, such as the Marshall Islands. Much of its territory is leased to the United States military, and its population is very poor. Ethiopia has been called a Chinese neo-colony, but China contributes to its industrialization. Ethiopia is, by the way, a country in which we've done field work recently, at least just before the pandemic. Uh, the Ethiopian government has agency again in dealing with China and has kept close ties, meanwhile, to the United States, at least until the United States decided this year to impose sanctions on Ethiopia. Well, China can't be neo-colonialist because it needs developing countries more than they need China especially in terms of political support, for example, in international organizations. Chinese in some countries also are not in a secure position. They may be threatened by opposition parties, anti-Chinese agitation. China, unlike the United States, thus can't threaten other countries with invasion, with regime change, or with sanctions, as a colonial power certainly could do. So far, we've been talking about what China is not. Um, in the next two parts, we're going to discuss what China is. So in the current world system, uh, China is a semi-periphery uh, economy, and that has been indicated by uh, these um, characteristics. China's intellectual property exports in 2019 were only 17% of its IP imports. And the U.S. exports of IP was actually 28 times those of China. And among the world's 100 most valuable brands 
there's only one that's Chinese, which is Huawei. And China's global trade in goods is only 11% of the world's total, and the services are only 6%. And U.S. per capita gross national income is 3.8 times of China's in terms of purchase power parity. And China's G GNI per capita is lower than Mexico's. And U.S. wealth per capita is seven times of China's in terms of PPP. China has 18% of world's population, but its household consumption is about 10% of the world's total. Before COVID-19 outbreak, foreign funded enterprises put in China produced one quarter of China's industrial output and 43% of China's exports by value. Foreign funded enterprises have about 40% share of top 30 brands in 10 consumer categories in China's markets. The top Chinese firms earn about 18% of their revenues abroad, while top 500 global firms earn 44% of their revenues abroad. Western capital outflows per capita were 24 times those of China's in 2017. And China's global stock of outward foreign direct investment in late 2019, before the uh, COVID-19 outbreak, was 2.2 trillion. The US was 7.7 .7 trillion. In 2020, China's outward foreign direct investment stock as a share of China's GDP was 15%. And that is one third of the world's average, which is 46% and about one-sixth of EU's average, which is 86%. The China cannot use force for global hegemony as US has done. Um, between year 2000 and 2017, US has 92 cases, uses of force and wars. And China can only aspire to be a leading state among semi-peripheral and peripheral countries. China privatized 80% of its firms by year 2000. At the time, non-state-owned enterprises accounted for 60% of China's GDP. So this is, we're talking about China now being semi-neoliberal. But state-owned enterprises in 2019 still accounted for 23 to 29% of GDP, um, one quarter of urban employment, 60% of corporate debt, and 60% of Chinese outward foreign direct investment. 150,000 state-owned enterprises had 30 trillion US dollars in assets, and their profits averaged about 4% per year. State-owned enterprises have been buying shares in recent years in non-state-owned enterprises in China. By 2016, there is a tendency to re-embed um, Chinese Communist Party in enterprises. So 70% of non-state firms and 70% of foreign funded firms had Chinese Communist Party branch, up from 16% in 2008. The percentage of CCP members is highest in the firm's top ranks. China still limits foreign firm access in the oil, gas, coal, steel, electric power, media, and telecommunication sectors. Uh, but it has recently opened its financial sector, including banking and insurances to uh, foreign capital. Chinese activities abroad, especially in developing countries, may foster industrialization rather than de-industrialization that is typical of the core country activities in developing countries. Chinese capital takes into account the sending and host state political aims. For example, during the global financial crisis in 2008, the price of copper fell sharply. Some foreign mining firms abandoned their mines in Zambia and others laid off most of its workers. In the, the main Chinese mining company in Zambia, however, which is state-owned enterprise uh, by China, 
did not cut back uh, on its projects, did not lay off workers, but instead expanded. Another example, during its civil war in South Sudan, uh, the government there asked China to keep in, an oil, in its oil fields about 300 employees, Chinese employees, that are needed to maintain the oil production. While at the same time, the Chinese also trained local replacements. Uh, in Ghana, during 2015 economic downturn, China's ambassador said Chinese enterprises, quote, do not withdraw investment, do not stop production, do not lay off workers, and do not diminish social responsibility. During the Ebola crisis in West Africa, um, Chinese continued to install cell phone networks, building dams, etc., uh, while other foreigners left. Uh, in Zambia, when other firms abandoned road building at times of extreme bad weather, Chinese firms continued to work. In the COVID-19 pandemic, Chinese firms were much more likely to try to maintain projects in developing countries uh, than Western companies. Chinese state-owned enterprises do not have the new liberal obligation to respond to holder interests, while what many Western companies do. And um, Instead, they have political obligation to respond to home, that is Chinese government, and uh, host state policies. And when layoffs do occur at Chinese state-owned enterprises abroad, they are more often uh, temporary and less encompassing than the other than the other firms. And China has accepted an elaborate uh, neoliberal division of labor and diminution of the planned economy. But on the other hand, there are other neoliberal policies which China will not or have not taken on, which include wholesale privatization, uh, renunciation of planning and state withdrawal from the market. Semi, uh, other scholars in China have also characterized, characterized China as semi and semi-neoliberalism. And uh, semi-neoliberalism is not only just found in China, but is also found in other countries such as Bolivia, Norway. Most Chinese elites uh, would spurn the neoliberalist essence of always more markets, always less, uh, less government. And China has largely escaped Western neoliberal financialization um, as public finance predominates still in China and private finance is still regulated. There has been a recent steep rise in non-financial sector debt in China and the pressure on China to open its markets to, this, to the sale of collateralized securities. That could lead to a crisis that affects the global economy. Now come to our conclusion. China's presence overseas, especially in developing country, is not colonialism or neocolonialism. China rules um, nowhere. There have been no example of Chinese economic domination. Uh, China does not exercise determinative political influence in any country. China's overall effect has been to stimulate capitalist dynamics from below and from above in developing countries and to promote industrial growth. And Chinese entities need to hew to home state, that is China, and host government's policies. Western entities, we're talking about institutions, uh, media outlets, when they deploy a discourse of Chinese colonialism or neocolonialism, neo the aim is to show the superiority of liberal political systems and to present Western influence as necessary to developing countries' advancement, to also include the history of colonial oppression of the colonized, and to transfer the stigma of colonialism to their Chinese rivals, to also vindicate Western neoliberal opposition to state-centered development, and to boost nationalism in historically colonizing countries in the West.
And Chinese neocolonialism is another example of the U.S. applying to other countries a negative term better applied to itself. For example, China is said to practice mercantilism, which is a 17th century and 18th century system based on the idea of a finite global volume of trade, state promotion of specific exports by private firms, restrictions of imports through high tariff barriers, and striving for trade surpluses. But China's global average of tariff is only 3.8% the average of upper middle income countries. It does not force countries, other countries into exclusive trade or threaten to cease trade with them. Its net trade surplus in 2018 was only 1.3% of its GDP, while Germany's and South Korea's typically range from 5% and 8%. The US actually comes closer to using aspects of mercantilism, including through trade wars and sanctions. China's practices in going out are instead tied to her semi-peripheral status and semi-neoliberalism. China impacts developing states through semi-neoliberalism, partially participating in a neoliberal global system that has disadvantageous terms of trade extraction of resources, oppressive labor regimes, and a cooperation with malign rulers. It is nevertheless implausible to imagine China becoming a colonial or neo-colonial power. That's the end of our presentation. Thank you all for listening. Oh, sorry, there's one more page. <laughs> um, China cannot wholly dis discard the socialist legacy that many of the people still expect and affirm, and still commands state-owned state -owned enterprises and influences the private firms not to solely adhere to the profit maximization principle, which is typical of so-called international standard. And as long as it does that, and China will likely avoid the main driver of colonialism, neocolonialism, and imperialism. Now, this time, it's a real end. Thank you all for listening. All right. Um, Yan Hairong and, and Barry Salman, thank you so much for uh, a very informative and, and in-depth presentation. Next up, we have Ting's Chak. Uh, who is a writer and artist based in Shanghai. She's a researcher and coordinator of the art department of Tricontinental Institute for Social Research, uh, and also recently led the study Serve the People, the Eradication of Extreme Poverty in China. She's also a founding member of Dongsheng News Collective. And uh, she will be speaking to us, as you might imagine, on poverty alleviation in China. So take it away, Tings. Um, yeah, yeah, uh, Tings, I think you're muted. Uh, oh, there we are. Right. Thank you. Simple technology. Cool. Yeah. Um, thank you, Charles. That. Thank you to all the organizers from Chow Collective, the People's Forum, uh, the Monthly Review, and uh, Code Pink. It's an honor to be joining you all the way from Shanghai today. Um, so without further ado, um, yes, I'm going to be talking about poverty alleviation. And just to start us off with the, the big announcement that we heard earlier this year, which is when China announced that poverty, extreme poverty, had been abolished. Uh, and for a country of 1.4 billion, it's, it's quite uh, a miraculous statement to make. And to put it in context, um, since the opening up of foreign period, that is, since the last four decades, China has lifted 850 million people out of poverty. So for comparison, that's the population of Latin America, the Caribbean, plus most of the U.S. combined. Um, and during this period, China actually contributed to 76% of the global reduction of poverty. And these numbers are, I want to take a second to just digest that, because in this current conjuncture we're living in, um, and we're seeing across the world the, how the economic crises that preexisted have been deepened um, in the pandemic moment. 
um, we've actually seen huge increases in extreme poverty uh, and actually the first reversal of global poverty since 1998. Um, and instead of actually eradicating poverty as the you know, United Nations and you know, SDG goals have said by 2030, um, the world's gonna see uh, over 1 billion people living in extreme poverty. So for anyone, you know, there's a question about China and the left today, um, combating poverty and sort of, and sort of learning from um, some inspirations and lessons from China is an urgent question of our times and, and definitely for those of us from the left. So today I'm gonna to share some of the, you know, findings uh, that went and the research that went behind that study that Charles, you mentioned already, and we have on the screen here. Um, and, and uh, a team of us were able to actually, you know, go look at the literature, um, go interview some experts both in China and internationally, uh, go do some field research, or you know, going down to the countryside, as we say. Um, we got to meet, um, you know, party cadres, peasants, women, elders, and and some of those stories I, uh, we share in the study, and and I'll try to bring a couple of them uh, today. Um, so I just wanted to take us to a few sort of key takeaways that we learned from the study. And um, maybe the um, first of all, um, when we look at the Chinese poverty alleviation program, though we were focusing on the last eight years, which is called the targeted poverty alleviation, and I'll explain a bit more about what that means. Um, we have to understand that this is a um, project since the develop since the creation of the People's Republic of China in 1949. So at its center has been consistently the question of poverty, the question of hunger um, in the process of transitioning to socialism. So we have to think about it in the historical approach. But knowing that we learned five key, key points in, this, in doing this study. And the first is that China relied heavily on a, on a holistic or almost like multi-dimensional approach uh, to poverty. That is not looking just at tra cash transfer or welfare-based welfare schemes, um, but looking at some of the, uh, let's say, root causes of uh, poverty uh, in many dimensions. So that's an important part. The second is actually looking at how much the grassroots base building work of the party, uh, especially in, you know, at the, the most base level in the countryside, was an uh, important aspect of the success of this campaign. Um, and beyond the mobilization of the base is actually the mobilization of the broad sectors of society, the society as a whole, in, in, um, from the private to the public uh, to the civil sector. Um, next, we have, and it's important to note, the, the role of the peasants and the poor people themselves in participating as protagonists in being lifted and lifting themselves out of poverty. Um, and finally, um, like, um, many of us who are socialists and on the left, we understand that ex eliminating extreme poverty is, is an issue of class struggle. Um, and ultimately it's just a, a stage in the construction of socialism um, and not in itself an end goal. So moving um, beyond this, I, I wanted to mention a little bit, I tell you a story, uh, especially bringing this historical lens uh, of socialist construction, which this study comes uh, inaugurates a series called uh, Studies in Socialist Construction, is that I met this uh, grandmother um, in uh, Guizhou in one of the poor uh, provinces, historically poor provinces in Southwest China. And her and her family exited extreme poverty during the most uh, recent campaign uh, since 2013. And just to give you a sense, she's born more or less the, at the time of the Chinese Revolution. When she was born, to give a sense of where uh, the, the situation of uh, PRC was, uh, China was actually the 11th poorest country in the world when we look at per uh, capita GDP. That is to say that only eight countries in Africa and two countries in Asia were poorer than China. So of course this looks, and I just want to point to uh, the century of humiliation and just it bears repeating and actually just as a side note, an important side note, I would say, is today just here in Shanghai and many cities across the country, um, the, the country more or less stopped for a moment when the sirens rang because today is the um, 90th anniversary of the September 18th incident or it's known as the Mukden incident um, sometimes. 
outside of China, uh, the Jap uh, which is the day when the Japanese um, invasion began and it marked a 14 year uh, long war, um, you know, resisting Japanese fascism that claimed up to 30 million Chinese people's lives. And that's just important to note in terms of the, the state that China was in was after a long uh, a century of, um, of really suffering at the hands of European uh, colonial powers, a really bloody civil war, the uh, Japanese occupation, uh, and internal dynamics such as feudalism, et cetera. So back to um, the story of this grandmother here. So when she was born, the life expectancy was under 40 years old. Um, she's now 70 and basically has already doubled her lifespan than she would have lived if she uh, 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 was, uh, you know, lived until her, her life expectancy at the time. Um, and at that time, um, 90% of women were illiterate, and now we have a, a literacy rate of over 95%. And, and I wanted to use her as an example to understand the kind of multi-generational uh, uh, struggle against poverty that looks at um, the industrial, the economic, the social gains that began under the Mao Zedong period and early socialist period, then which formed the foundation of the reform and opening up period under Deng Xiaoping. And, and we can't understand the elimination of poverty today without recognizing that the massive economic growth of the period in the last 40 years did develop the productive forces so that hundreds of millions of people did exit extreme poverty. But economic development alone um, can't resolve the needs of the poor. And this is where we come into this phase of, of what's called the targeted poverty alleviation um, that uh, was began under President Xi in uh, 2013, that looked at the remaining 100 million people that were still living uh, in the deepest pockets of poverty, where economic development itself uh, didn't quite reach. And as an overview of the program, um, uh, this is just um, some of the key data of the program, and, and don't want to overwhelm with too much data, but just to say that a huge amount of state investment uh, and up to 250 billion US dollars was spent to build million, millions of kilometers of rural roads to ensure that every, every village can get connected into the road systems. But that extends to also internet access and uh, um, millions of homes that were renovated or newly constructed to ensure that the last nearly 100 million poor people were lifted out of poverty uh, from 128,000 villages. And um, it can be summarized into uh, uh, basically a, a, a slogan, which is the one income, two assurances, and three guarantees. And what is one income? Okay, so of course, I, it is, as we mentioned, it's a, it's a multi-dimensional approach. The first is the income line. So China uses a, a standard that's actually higher than the World Bank uh, line for extreme poverty, which is set at $1.90 a day. Um, and in China, it's two dollars and thirty cents. But probably more important, uh, more importantly, is in addition to income, there are these five other indicators. The there are the two assurances, which is that um, no one has to worry about food and clothing, and then the three guarantees, which is uh, the guarantee of basic met, uh, uh, access to basic medical services, um, free and compulsory education, which in China is nine years and um, access to uh, a housing with drinking water and electricity. So what's really quite interesting is, um, and so this is the idea that you can't use a grenade to blast a flea, that in order to reach the deepest pockets of poverty, um, you can't actually do the large scale development led um, uh, poverty reduction, but actually go and know uh, where the poor people are, what are the conditions, and what plans can be made from household to household to make sure that they emerge from extreme poverty. And so this is the, the slogan I had just mentioned. So to go about actually knowing then who the poor actually are and where they are for a country of 1.4 billion is pretty a, a impressive undertaking. And so how how is this done? Um, just as a kind of reminder, you know, China, the Communist Party of China has is a massive organization. 
It has 95.1 million members and nearly 5 million organizations, pretty much at every level of, of social life. Um, and so in uh, 2014, at the beginning of this um, campaign, 800,000 party cadres were actually organized to go into the countryside and literally knock on the doors of the millions of households. And that's to look at income sources, education, housing conditions, health, and and this was all put into a national database of a hundred million registered poor people in the program, registered in the program. But I, I think it's also important to recognize that it's not just um, you know officials deciding whether a family is poor or not, but there is also a process of a grassroots democracy, let's say, that takes place in these um, what are called uh, democratic appraisal meetings, where um, villagers actually come together and. They debate and, and discuss the conditions of each family. You know, who should be listed as poor? Um, have they been lifted out of poverty? Have they fallen back into poverty? Um, is someone's neighbor, you know, hiding the fact that he has three goats and hasn't reported the extra income he gets from his son, et cetera. I mean, it is actually um, a process uh, in the grassroots um, um, life, really. And. And there's that aspect, but beyond those cadres that were actually sent to identify um, who the poor households were or, or people who were registered in the program, there were actually 3 million um, cadres that were sent to the countryside. Um, and they were actually sent there for, you know, upwards of two, three, four years at a time to live in the, in the villages. And uh, there's one cadre assigned to each household and one team to get working with, with local leaders, community leaders, local officials that form a, uh, a team that is assigned to a village. And I think it's important to note that the conditions were very tough. Um, over 1,800 people actually died in the process. It's, it's living really uh, among the people in the, um, the poorest communities that exist, uh, existed in, in China. And, and during the process of the study, we actually got to go on some of the visits uh, with these local cadres and you know the basic work it's it's nothing glamorous it's it's you know your your cell phone is basically buzzing all the time uh, it's uh you know mr Zhang like calling you messaging you telling you oh my front door lock isn't working uh can you come over and help me fix it or mrs maybe it's mrs uh wang's daughter who isn't wanting to go to school can you please come over and talk to her? Maybe someone's auntie is sick. Um, someone's uncle lost a job. It's this kind of level of detail and really responding to the material needs of every individual that forms the backbone of uh, the poverty alleviation program. And and it's probably, I mean, from this perspective, from from within China, it's not surprising to see that uh, because of the the victory, um, let's not say victory, I guess victory over extreme poverty and also the control of the COVID vi virus in um, a relatively short period that the actual party itself and the government is gaining, is, has pretty high po uh, popular support. And it's something that you might not see in reading Western media. It seems like every day it's, you know, people are ready to you know, overthrow the government, um, but that's just simply not true. Um, and moving forward, I just wanted to talk a little bit about the campaign itself and how, how it, um, so this is the process of the uh, grassroots democracy. Sorry, I, I've not been moving forward with my slides. I've just been talking. Um, so beyond mobilizing the actual uh, party itself is this uh, forming of a kind of united front against poverty. So this mobilization of not only public support, but uh, different uh, sectors of society. Um, engaging, for example, with private enterprises and linking private enterprises with villages, uh, or in engaging with civil society to students, academics, um, and and th this uh, this I actually found quite interesting is the national pro uh, training programs that existed for uh, training teachers and doctors to go in and teach in the poor areas, the ethnic minority areas, for a period of time in exchange for free uh, tuition, free education. So um, just to get a sense under these schemes, uh, 17 million rural teachers were trained and 190,000 of them were actually dispatched to the countryside. 
Um, in addition to that, there were 60,000 medical students that received um, the training um, from the medical side. And of course, um, this kind of sort of strategy of United Front is understanding that um, the party alone cannot carry out a task this large. It really is uh, a society-wide um, uh, mobilization. And this and was mobilized through um, five key uh, methods of how to reduce uh, poverty. And the first, of course, and foremost is industry. It's developing productive capacity. Um, it's you know agriculture, building agricultural cooperatives. It's trying to connect uh, uh, peasant producers to urban markets, um, especially uh, via uh, the internet or e-commerce methods. Um, I won't go into too much of this. All of this is really in the study. I'll just kind of go through quickly the five methods. Um, the second is is looking at education, um, specifically um, not only just building of new schools or improving existing ones, but it's training of new educators, as I as I mentioned and also huge incentives for uh, people coming from peasant families or uh, poor families registered in the programs to access higher education, especially, specifically university. Uh, and one thing we found quite impressively is that over the last decade, and, and most of this falls under this poverty alleviation period, 70% um, of first year students in Chinese universities were the first ever in their families to attend. So 70%. And then 70% of those students were actually students coming from the countryside. So there, there's a, a, a kind of huge um, a jump in terms of access uh, to higher education, especially for people coming from the rural areas. Um, and this also looks at, uh, uh, at the status of women. Um, last year, according to the Global Gender Gap Report, um, China has reached, uh, its number uh, ranks the first in terms of gender equality in higher education. So there's actually more women in universities than men now in, in Chinese universities. Um, so going into the, the next of the methods is uh, what's called ecological compensation. And it's a kind of interesting word in English. It sounds a bit funny, but um, this is really about generating work, uh, generating jobs through ecological conservation and restoration projects. Um, of course, the, the period of the rapid expansion came uh, economic expansion over the last 40 years came at a heavy cost to the to the environment. Um, and so there's been huge campaigns around whether it's the rebuilding of new forests uh, or restoring of old forests, for example. And that's been a huge part of also uh, generating um, uh, jobs such as tree planting, but also forest rangers among a whole uh, slew of related industries. Uh, the fourth um, is the method of social assistance. Of course, there are many people who are unable to work, people who have disabilities, who are the elderly, um, and, and there are social assistance programs embedded in the TPA or the, the Targeted Poverty Alleviation Scheme, uh, including subsidies and, and, um, and, and other welfare schemes. And the, and the final method is, is more for kind of extreme cases. Um, you know, sometimes you'll see these uh, uh, very remote areas where you know the de bringing development or infrastructure is not feasible. Like for example, could be cliff villages, the more kind of um, uh, more renowned examples. So for about 10% of those 100 million people that were lifted in the recent eight years, were actually uh, done so by relocating because they were living in um, perhaps places exposed to frequent disasters or extremely remote, as I said, uh, which makes it impossible really to break the cycle of poverty, the, that intergenerational poverty, without moving to more habitable, uh, habitable environment. Um, and I, I might just end um, this part here with telling another um, uh, part and this aspect of poor people as protagonists. And um, I, I met this one woman in, in a, one of these relocated communities uh, her name is Her Ying. She's actually the daughter of the grandmother I had mentioned at the beginning. And so um, Her Ying is in her 40s. And like uh, many poor peasant um, women, she used to work as a, as a migrant worker in uh, the province of Guangdong. Um, and, and which means that she actually had to leave her first son behind to the care of her parents. 
and this is sort of what's known as the left behind children in China. Um, and while she was working as a migrant worker, she could only go home once a year to visit them. And so she told me um, why she wanted to relocate or to choose to relocate under the government's poverty program is that she said she was pregnant with her second son. And even though her own family initially opposed because they didn't know what it would entail to join this program, um, she made the choice to say she wanted to, to uh, participate. She wanted to actually have a chance to, to live and work with her family in, uh, in, a, in a place um, where you know, school, uh, the kids can access education, the parents can access health care, et cetera. And we kind of followed her with a, on a, a day. And every morning she wakes up at 7.30 a.m. and drops her kid at school, which is uh, a five minute walk away instead of the two hours each way that it used to take in the village. Um, the community she lives in has three childcare facilities, uh, a middle school um, and a high school and three health clinics. Uh, and Ying's family of 10 that used to live in an 80 square meter apartment together now lives in three apartments, each of 200 square meters. And, um, and then each family has received you know, some living subsidies and also a kind of furnished house that's ready to move into. But of course, I don't wanna kind of romanticize this. It's that the transition is not easy. You know, there's a change in a way of life, especially for some of the uh, elders who have always lived in the countryside. Um, but what's important to note is that there's actually a process of um, sort of uh, convincing and a process of uh, getting to know what are the concerns, fears, and needs to be addressed. Um, for example, for someone like the grandmother I mentioned who have, has never maybe been to a city before or hasn't even seen a traffic light before, what, what, what do you do to respond to that? So one of the programs that this community organizes is called Six Firsts. So it's the six, time, uh, six things that you do for the first time. And they organize these high school students in the community to go and teach elders to, for example, how to cross at a crosswalk for the first time, how to ride an elevator, how to go to the supermarket or how to go sightseeing in the, the, the city. Um, and so this is sort of organized by the many of the party cadres that live in the community. There's 12 of them in the community of 18,000. Um, and and I, one of the parts of her young story that really touched me is that it's actually in this process of her not only experiencing the material changes of migration to you know, the, the new community, but also the subjective changes. Because in the process of that transformation of you know, participating in the lifting of herself and her own family out of poverty, she actually became a party leader and a chairperson of the local uh, women's federation and including organizing activities such as this, as the six first that I mentioned. And she also told me that um, her first son, uh, the one that she had to leave behind when she was a migrant worker, um, uh, actually is now studying at the local city uh, vocational or technical school, and he's studying elevator maintenance. And she, she gave a, a simple explanation. She was very happy about it. She says, there are 64 elevators in the community. So studying maintenance means he can actually come back and contribute to the community um, and, and serve the people. And of course, that's where we also get the inspiration and the name from the famous words of Mao uh, for the name of this study. And, and so I want to I want to highlight and end with her story because I think a, a national program of this size isn't just measured by the big numbers that we can talk about how many trillions of RMB were spent, but actually against the life of a, a poor peasant woman like Ho Ying and, and the experiences that she actually lived uh, lived through. So as a final note is that uh, I think there are many, many contradictions and challenges in, in China today and eliminating extreme poverty is just one of the stepping stones um, in a place where class struggle is quite alive. Um, there are questions about you know, inequality, questions about relative poverty and the next stages in, in this process. So part of our am ambition in coming, bring the study and also sharing it today at this event is to at least bring a bit of this um, experience, some of the complexities, some of the theories and practices behind China's process, uh, its combat against poverty, 
And that has been really silenced in the media in the West. And those in the US will know quite well that the, the PBS um, documentary jointly made with CGTN by uh, Robert Lawrence Kuhn, who we also spoke to in uh, the study, um, his uh, poverty alleviation documentary was actually censored. And Code Pink has been leading one of those, uh, the campaign to get it back on air. And, and Robert told me that of the 4,000 programs he's made for PBS, the only one that's been censored is about China's poverty alleviation campaign. So one of the questions for us is why would a story of limiting poverty and sharing that with the world be threatening um, to the US or, or threatening to um, uh, the world? So ultimately for us who are socialists on the left, the question of eradicating poverty and learning from it is because we're interested in the process of class struggle, that we believe that for the working classes of the world, the poor of the world, to be able to study, to have a house, to be fed, to enjoy culture are just aspirations that we all share and we should fight for. So with that, I wanna thank everyone um, for the uh, conference today. All right, thanks so much, Tings, um, for a fantastic presentation. Um, next up, we have Max Isle, who is a postdoctoral fellow at the Rural Sociology Group at Wageningen University, I think, uh, and an associate researcher at the Tunisian Observatory for Food Sovereignty and the Environment. His articles have been published in the Journal of Peasant Studies, Review of African Political Economy, and Globalizations. He's an associate editor at Agrarian South, and his book, A People's Green New Deal, was published in 2021 with Pluto Press. He'll be speaking on the early Chinese path as a model for third world development. Take it away, Max. Uh, thank you so much for the, the introduction. Um, thanks to Child Collective and People's Forum and Monthly Review, uh, Code Pink, and my fellow speakers. Um, Thank you for trying to pronounce Wageningen. I can't pronounce it either. So this is pretty much a shared experience we have. Um, and uh, apologies to the audience for the slightly uh, jarring introduction of a discussion of the pre-1978 development path. Uh, I was supposed to be on a later panel, but I, there were some logistical issues. Uh, so I'm gonna start with a small anecdote. Um, in July, 1968, the Tunisian uh, super planner, uh, Ahmed Ben Salah, gave a speech blasting the extremist opinions in his words linked to international solidarity from the lovers of sabotage, and from those running after foreign ideologies like what he called the Chinese doctrine. He made clear that Tunisia was not and would not be China. And this was on the heels of massive student unrest on the universities that had in fact spread beyond them also into high schools. Why was he pushed to make this point? First, of course, was the popularity of Maoism and even the broader popularity of the Chinese development experience within Tunisia. In fact, by 1968, this was the case across the Arab region and for that matter, in ever widening swaths of Africa including Tanzania and of course, even earlier, and which had propelled Tanzania or forced it to adopt these, uh, these policies and this enthrallment with China, uh, what had occurred in Zanzibar. Why was China such an icon in that moment? The success of China in developing to that point showed that nations in the formerly colonized or third world could develop they could change what was going on in their system. They were not fated to a future of stagnancy of China as a source of Arab theories of development. And this is not an intellect. It speaks directly to contemporary developmental dilemmas because the third world on the whole could greatly benefit benefit from the types of developmental interventions of the earlier period of the People's Republic, which are submitting to it because of the prescience of its agrarian policies, uh, especially those related to forms of farming, related to contemporary agroecology, 
and the way those insights were developed by Arab theorists at the moment. On the theory and practice of Mao Zedong, articulated most pithily in the statement that we stand for self-reliance. He had put that principle into practice during the guerrilla war against the occupiers through maximizing the local production of goods. And local did not merely mean within a given nation state or even a province. It meant devolving production down to the smallest possible unit. This cellular approach to development continued to inform China's post-1949 efforts towards radical nationalist development. The Arab theories of self-reliance drew on the Chinese experience in order to take several lessons. One, China had offered a model for a status developmentalism that catered to the needs of the population, not merely through redistribution or, uh, or through the more important step of shattering the spine of the feudal aristocracy, but actually creating new and more productive rural social layers and new and more ultimately more productive forms of rural social organization. All the while, while the state was the coordinator of the entire economic production process. China, almost uniquely, had put peasants at the core of this fresh synthesis of theory and practice. Three, China had not cleaved apart national and social liberation or put them into stages, but rather had sought to combine them. Four, these thinkers again and again focused on the experience of rapid industrialization in a poor agrarian country. They saw how China had linked technological mastery and the endogenation, endogenization of technology to its national project. And they saw that China was beginning to exemplify a process of sovereign industrialization. Five, what very much impressed a variety of thinkers was how China had successfully stopped the outward flow of surpluses, the wound of colonial drain, which the Arab thinkers had seen had festered under various forms of post-colonial or neo-colonial developmentalism. Six, China had delinked. Seven, China's encouragement of self-reliance, not merely at the national, but also at the sub-national and even village level, was linked to a massive underknown experimentation with enhancing traditional farming practices so as to maximize yield without having to bring in expensive inputs. Eight, the model ultimately shattered the notion of technological neutrality and helped people fit, grasp at the idea of a more decentralized administration of society. It put forward the idea that societies should choose developmental paths based on their own internal needs and their own sense of their internal and external balances, rather than submitting to externally imposed valuations. Now, these ideas, of course, were the most common ones which had been developed, uh, which a which, uh, very wide range of Arab thinkers, from Khalid al-Manubi to uh, Samir Amin to Adel Samara, uh, developed out from the Chinese experience. But they also did not merely extol the Chinese experience. They actually took that experience and reworked it into theories of development that they thought were suitable for their society. The most famous of these, and one which, of course, has, I think the, has had the widest contemporary reach, is this idea, the idea of delinking, which is associated with uh, the recently uh, deceased Samir Amin. Delinking was a model essentially drawn entirely from the Chinese experience, or at least from the state of the art then existing scholarship on the Chinese experience. Delinking did not mean autarky. It did not mean a purely self-reliant development strategy shorn of any form of exchange or Congress with the outside world. It meant a process through which an internal popular alliance 
would impose constraints on the developmental process. And in turn, the government would make choices according to a popular law of value based on the short and long-term interests of workers and peasants. That alliance, the alliance that had won the liberation war, could, through delinking, set in motion a positive program resting on three pillars. One was to renounce world cap capitalist rationality and ideas of comparative advantage and subject all in external relations to internal choices and values. This also relied on the political capacity to introduce reforms in an egalitarian direction. This capacity, of course, also lay at the genesis of delinking, so the extant since the extant domestic bourgeoisie were perfectly happy with the status quo. The third pillar of delinking was developing a capacity for technological absorption and ingenuity. Subsequent thinkers uh, working in parallel with Amin would in fact develop, especially this last, into a very novel model uh, that uh, contemporary uh, forms of agroecology are in many ways uh, redeveloping. So Ismail Sabri Abdullah, for example, focused on village level development, rural and decentralized industrialization, focusing on the ecological damage, damages linked to dependent industrialization and the bigness fetish animating ongoing peripheral industrialization, including, of course, the process of offshore. Another major thinker, totally unknown, is the Tunisian uh, agronomist, Salahdine Lamani, who essentially developed a Tunisian variant of agroecology that focused on looking at development on appropriate timescales, including the very long term, focused on the use and deployment of scarce resources in a, the semi-arid environment, which prevailed not only in much of Tunisia, but across mo much of the Arab world who focused on valorizing uh, traditional peasant technologies, including decentralized uh, labor-intensive hydraulics. This is directly drawn from the Chinese experience. And finally, who focused above all on remolding the internal agricultural system. So it was focused on feeding and the permanent, uh, the permanent protection of scarce natural resources and uh, seizing imports from the imperial core through a process of uneven accumulation. Uh, another very important figure here it was and is uh, Adel Samara, the Palestinian development economist who's been focusing on theories of development by popular production that actually builds development into uh, the, it builds uh, popular participation into the development process rather than making it a double stage process. Now, why is this still relevant? Right? Is this just a museum expedition? Uh, or is this just an exercise in intellectual history? Um, I don't think so at all. Uh, and, and we know this, I think, and uh, because we know what the situation is in most of the third world, right? We know that what is called the development project actually failed to bring about a process of development. Uh, we know that the dominant situation of uh, poor people in the third world is semi-proletarianization, where people continue to rely in one way or another on agriculture for a portion of their family's social reproduction to the tune of at least 50, if not up to 70% of the population in third world countries. And we know that the process of dependent industrialization, which was supposed to bring about development in the third world, totally failed. We also know that there is ongoing agrarian concentration, inequality and in access to land. And we know that the countries of the third world continue to be highly dependent on food imports from the first world, which in fact becomes murderous in the case of countries like Venezuela, and especially for example, Yemen, where, uh, and it also in Cuba during uh, the special period where countries inability to feed themselves then became a weapon against the, the domestic population. And all of these, of course, are symptoms of uh, the more the, the basic process of entire social systems that are structured so as to secure the outward flow of value from the periphery to the core. Uh, the reason I think 
that the thinking of these uh, these development theorists, but also why um, still has value, and why in fact many of these ideas continue to still be relevant to contemporary developmental processes across the periphery, are because the solutions that China proposed, although with a modification and an upgrading uh, with our contemporary knowledges are still the solutions that can break uh, the pattern of underdevelopment and outward flow of surplus. The solutions are still agrarian reform, breaking apart the large feudal states. The solutions are still processes of sovereign as opposed to unsovereign industrialization that rest on technology transfer. And finally, the solution is taking the very uh, popular, understandably idea of food sovereignty and agroecology, but making sure that it comes under the umbrella of national liberation project for the peripheral states of the world system. So uh, I think that these are lessons that need to be go need to be uh, need to be taken seriously in terms of uh, thinking about development processes in the future. And uh, and I think the experience of China from 1949 to 1978 not only merits study but also merits uh, study for the purposes of actually learning to change the world. So thank you very much, um, and that's what all I have today. Um, yeah, thank you so much, Max, for uh, shedding light, as always, on a um, criminally understudied, uh, you know, developmental model and its connections to China. Uh, last, uh, the last speaker for this panel is Sit Sui, who is an associate professor at the Institute of Rural Reconstruction of uh, China, Southwest University. She is a board member of Asian Regional Exchange for New Alternatives and is one of the founding members of the Global University for Sustainability. She has been actively involved in the rural reconstruction movement in China since 2000. And she'll be speaking to us today uh, on confronting the triple trap in China. Thank you very much for inviting me to share the experience in, in China. And my uh, presentation is called uh, Confronting the Triple Trap in China. And uh, how uh, how I define the um, the triple trap, confronting the triple trap of the COVID nineteen pandemic, the crisis of globalization, and the new Cold War. China has responded by implementing the policy of dual circulation. That means domestic and international circulations. Historically, rural China has always played a role of social stabilizer along the the path or industrialization and even financialization. Recently, China has deployed the policy for ecological civilization and rural revitalization, which defend ecological rationality, collective ownership of land resources, and, co and cooperative economy. Since 2000, uh, the new rural reconstruction movement initiated from the below has mobilized thousands of officials intellectuals, workers, peasants, and students to join the ongoing trend of ecological and social justice. And um, we work with a uh, monthly review to pu publish uh, Asami Amin, the second memoir. It's called uh, The Long Revolution of the Global South Toward a New Anti-Imperialist International. And this book can be free download at Global University website. And in 2018, Samir Amin uh, reminds us that contemporary uh, capitalism is ruled by a handful of gigantic oligarchies, that means financial monopolies. And this uh, mainly uh, come from the triad, that means the United States, Europe, and Japan. And they control more than 89% of the gigantic volume of transactions operate on, on the financial market. That's, that means uh, our common enemy actually is the financial capitalism. And um, you, you, uh, as you know that now the top 20 world banks in, uh, in 2021, the top four are, uh, come from China and they are all uh, state-owned banks. And another, uh, the uh, collective ownership is the land resources. Uh, and, uh, and 
on um in, on 24th of May in 2020, according to uh, Lin Zijie, uh, Deputy Chair of the National Development and Reform Commission, um, it's, it, he announced that China's total assets has exceeded uh, renminbi 1,300 trillion. That means about uh, US dollar 182 trillion in the form of financial and non-financial assets such as infrastructure uh, facilities. Uh, that means uh, why China become the, uh, the uh, top um, enemy of um, United States in the new Cold War, because China has maintained the collective ownership of land resources and also the banking system. And uh, during the pandemic, we already had, uh, has uh, proved the old and old Chinese saying remarks that to avoid a small uh, disturbance, stay in a city, to avoid a big upheaval, stay in a village. And uh, from the uh, pandemic, we have learned two lessons. The first one, that means uh, how we can def defend, uh, defend the public health care system and national food security. Uh, that means uh, we have to, um, Remember that uh, because of land revolution of 1949, we have land distribution. Uh, that means uh, that the peasants has a uh, house and land in the countryside and to have access to land. And that means has access to food. And, um, and, of, uh, and also, we also have the experience of how uh, fighting the SARS in 2003, because uh, we adopt the um, Chinese traditional medicine. That, that means from uh, these two pandemic, from the uh, SARS in 2003 and the uh, COVID-19 uh, pandemic, we learned that we have to revive all the subjugated knowledge, that means Chinese traditional medicine. And that's uh, how, uh, 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 apart from the uh, adopting Chinese uh, traditional medicine, we also found that the mass mobilization in the countryside and in the city uh, very important. How can we deal with the pandemic? And why uh, we uh, have this uh, uh, um, uh, comparative successful mass mobilization in the countryside and in the city? Because it, that is the legacy of land revolution. And uh, in uh, according to the official state uh, uh, statistics, uh, the TCN treatment reached over ninety percent. And also, uh, the uh, one of the uh, very useful uh, medicine is called the Lianhua Qingwen Jiao Lang. And uh, however, the uh, FDA uh, hasn't uh, approved those, uh, those the Chinese traditional medicine. Why? Because it's an effective, cheap. And that's why um, in the uh, global uh, uh, pharmaceutical uh, market, Chinese medicine, uh, ch TCM, Chinese traditional medicine, or other the uh, traditional medicine from the developing countries uh, is, are being subjugated in the, um, in the uh, drug uh, market. And I think this uh, in the next 10, in the next, uh, at least in next five or 10 years, uh, we should how uh, we should think about how to uh, revival uh, the traditional medicine because it's a very important to uh, fight the uh, pandemic and also the fight the uh, colonization of uh, medical knowledge. And uh, this is the official uh, uh, policy about the uh, internal circulation and also international uh, circulation. Uh, when we mean internal circulation, actually, uh, one of the important uh, policy is the rural uh, vitalization. And uh, the uh, President uh, Xi Jinping also has the theory of two mountains theory. But the, uh, the basic argument is how can we uh, defend the small peasantry and also rural communities and, uh, uh, in, uh, the, in the era of uh, ecological civilization. And uh, why uh, we also have to uh, protect the uh, rural community because uh, based on last year experience, uh, we have uh, we uh, and while we fighting the COVID nineteen pandemic, and be, and there is also the uh, turn uh, downturn in the world economy, uh, there are more than. 30 million migrant rural workers stay behind or return to their village home. So that's why how can we uh, and have a uh, 
or a, a comparative uh, stabilized uh, society. It depends on how we can uh, defend or uh, maintain rural communities. And um, our uh, global university has uh, published uh, a series of um, book. And the first one uh, is a winter gene 10 crisis, the political economy of China uh, development from 1949 to 2020. Uh, it can be downloaded from the uh, Global University website and also Power Million. And this uh, book also uh, to trace the e economic history of China, and um, but at the same time also to uh, how uh, to uh, to uh, demonstrate a uh, path how can uh, China can build up a kind of alternative trajectory. That means we have to uh, uh, work together for the integrate cooperation and governance and try to uh, protect the rural uh, China. And uh, uh, for based on the our experience for the last 20 years, we have initiated the uh, new rural reconstruction movement. And the first one is the uh, at the early 20th um, uh, century. And the second one is the uh, is, is the uh, 2000. Uh, why we have to uh, initiate rural reconstruction? Why rural reconstruction? Because rural the the con uh, destruction or uh, destroyed by modernization, by capitalist modernization. That is the uh, main reason why have we have to uh, reconstruction, rebuild or revital, revi uh, reactivate rural society again. And apart from the uh, tradition of rural reconstruction movement, we another tradition because uh, the communist uh, uh, struggle also have this uh, legacy, how uh, uh, intellectual or the young generation work together with the uh, person and workers during the 1960s, uh, uh, the, uh, during the Cultural Revolution, uh, there are a total of 40 million or unemployed educated youth going to the countryside. So based on these two rural reconstruction movement and also communist um, uh, uh, legacy, we also uh, to um, uh, carry on this legacy to um, mobilize the young people uh, to uh, involve in the organic farming and also to work with the, uh, 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 the peasants uh, in, in the countryside. So uh, we uh, ask, uh, we mobilize them to uh, join the training program uh, to under, to do the home visits, to learn from them. And also uh, we um, also send some uh, uh, young, uh, particularly university students uh, to work with the, um, the, uh, the peasant organization. Uh, one of the famous uh, peasant organization is called the Puhan Rural Communities. It's a staff from a uh, dancing club. The, the, the leader is a woman called uh, Zhen Bing. And staff from the uh, dancing club, uh, the uh, Puhan Rural uh, Community, start many uh, social and cultural activities. And also, they also uh, mobilize the peasant to uh, involve in the uh, uh, organic uh, farming. And um, uh, from this picture, you also you, you can see that they uh, how can they uh, work with the or uh, provide service for the women, the elderly, the children, and also to initiate a lot of the uh, volunteer work. For example, how to uh, 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 innovate their environment, and uh, also to revive all the traditional hand room. Uh, the uh, they set they help to set up the women handicraft cooperatives. And um, the uh, youth training program from uh, by uh, Liang Sumi Rural Reconstruction Center and uh, Yongji Puhan Village Community, uh, they uh, work together to uh, uh, organize the uh, uh, youth training programs. And this is uh, one of the training programs is to raise the uh, pig in the uh, ecological way. So uh, from this, uh, uh, our experience for the 20 years as an inter organic intellectual, we continue to uh, reconstruct the rural communities for integrated cooperation and governance and to uh, revitalize ecologic civilization. This is particularly important because we are in the uh, new Cold War and we have to, uh, to continue to do the mass mobilization 
and to uh, fight the uh, not only the um, financial uh, finance fin to against the the trend of financialization and also the uh, financial capitalism uh, how we can uh, uh, take root or uh, work together with the rural society is the most important task thank you very much All right, thank you very much, uh, Sitsue, and, and to all of our speakers in this first panel. Um, we are now going to be breaking an hour uh, for lunch. Um, so we hope to see you all back here at 1230 for Chow's opening keynote. Thanks so much. <laughs>